Why do things happen the way they do? When people say it was fate, like something was inevitable, it was fate, it was meant to happen. Is that true? When people say it was a sign, it was a sign that it was meant to be. Is that true? To people who lean more toward an Eastern way of thinking, I would ask, is karma real? And for those of you who lean more toward a Western way of thinking, the way to ask it is this. Do we really reap what we sow? Now, at first glance, you might say yes. I mean, after all, Paul in the scriptures, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. But the question is, was Paul trying to give that to us as a general sense, a principle of the way things usually work? Or was he declaring that in all instances, it's always true? Well, if you do want to reap, like think about real agriculture, if you want to have a harvest, you got to sow the seeds. So you got to sow the seeds if you want to reap. But what happens if you sow the seeds and then there's a hurricane that destroys your field? Do you reap then? No. Sometimes you don't reap what you sow. Sometimes it just seems like stuff randomly happens with no rhyme or reason. I sat with multiple people this week who were dealing with death. From the youngest little one you can imagine to an 80-year-old man. Sometimes random stuff, it seems, just happens. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Now, if you think about it, a lot of us, and I'm not making you raise your hands, but I think a lot of people in this room pay attention to the headlines, pay attention to recent events. Like most of us either listen in the car while we're driving to the news or we watch some news uh, show or we, we go to social media or someone comes to us and, and we talk about recent events. We talk about the headlines. I mean, you go to where people hang out. What are they doing? They're talking about stuff that happened and people are trying to figure out what does it mean? And, and what does it apply for the future? And was it meant to happen? Now, most of the time, Jesus, when he speaks, he gives these eternal values that apply to all places and all times. But did you know there's one very, very unique little scripture in Luke where Jesus actually intentionally talks about the headlines. He talks about the current events of that particular moment. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, starting in verse 1, it says this. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him, reported to Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So we know from historical, um, secular historians, there were several major incidents where Pilate did brutal things, right? So he's the Roman guy in charge. If he thinks there's any chance that anyone is getting uppity, he is brutal. So I want you to imagine what that current event was like to a very sacred religious people. Think about how horrible this was for people who were devout Jews. In the middle of performing a holy sacred act... These people were struck down by these secular oppressors, Rome, so that as they lay bleeding out on the floor, their spilled sacrifices mixed with their own blood, the sacrifices they had brought to honor God. So man, you talk about sacrilege, horror. And so back then, just like people today asked, why did that happen? Was it fate? Was it meant to be? 
Why would God allow such a thing to happen? There must be a reason. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, God knows and we don't. Maybe, maybe it's a sign. Perhaps those Galileans were actually evil people and they were actually getting what they deserved. Like God was using a secular force to give them what they deserved. In other words, it was karma. It was fate. But what happens in verse 2? And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the author of love, Jesus the Christ. Then he turns to another headline, just like you're going through the newspaper. He says, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? What do all the men who live in Jerusalem represent? All of us, everybody, normal people. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So think about the two examples that Jesus gives. First, what happened to the Galileans with Pilate. Apparently, God lets an evil person, Pilate, do terrible things to people who were trying to honor God. Why doesn't God restrain him? And then the second... Apparently, God lets a random act of nature, a wall falling, kill people who just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Why does God let it happen? And note, Jesus doesn't explain it. He doesn't explain why God allows it. Now, you got to get this. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God in flesh. Everybody's full of opinions. Let me ask you, I do want to raise a hand here. How many people think that what the world needs now are more opinions? <laughs> Everybody's got an opinion. Melissa, you? Oh my gosh. Everybody's got an opinion. The one person who was qualified to give an opinion, the one person who could have actually explained what it meant, refuses to explain it. But he makes one thing clear. It isn't karma. Karma is not real. It is a cruel belief. Sometimes you don't reap what you sow. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. In fact, the Bible is full of people crying out to God in the Psalms. Why do you let evil and greedy people become rich and fat and powerful while the innocent and desperate are abused? You guys, it's a great question. It's a question I've asked all my life. Especially when I've seen unbelievable sorrow. But I think Jesus says to us, what he once said to his disciples in Acts 1 7. It is not for you to know. It is not for you to know. And this brings us back to the temptations we saw last week. Are you willing to love and serve God even if he chooses not to give you the answers you so desperately? And appropriately want. But here's what you need to get. I am not asking you to live with an unfair God. I'm asking you to live with mystery. Are you willing? Are you willing to live with mystery. You see, I think in our technological age, we are tempted to wallpaper over 
all kinds of messy stuff because we can't stand the truth, which is this, that no matter how much our science advances, no matter how normal and repetitive and even monotonous life seems at times, a great deal of the human condition, if you're willing to open your eyes to it, a great deal of the human condition is dealing with questions, with the mysteries of our existence. Again, now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Why is there so much mystery? Because he, God, causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, in the case of this week, it's mostly the rain, right? Like this has been like the flood. But think about this. So much for people being treated as they deserve or based on what they've earned. It seems like everyone is going to get these primary blessings of light and water. The two things that we need, the two things that plants need to grow to give us food so that we can even live. And every day, again and again and again, God pours out these basic blessings to who? To everyone. So in Luke, Jesus tells us of bad things that happened to good people. They weren't any worse than anybody else. And here, he's telling us that really good things happen to bad people. God doesn't hold back these blessings, even if you're a terrible human being like Pilate. So then what might we conclude? Well, we might conclude, well, then it doesn't really matter what I do. Whether I am good or evil, God is still going to give me the same things. There doesn't seem to be any connection between your behavior and what happens to you. There is no guarantee of reward for good behavior. Let me just hit it one more time just to drive it home. There is no guaranteed reward for good behavior on this earth. Think about what did Billy Joel sing? Only the good die young. If there are no real consequences for being greedy or selfish or cruel, why not be all those things? But you see, when we were reading back in Luke 13, we didn't finish. We cut Jesus off in mid-sentence. Listen to what happens next. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and didn't find any. What is the purpose of a fig tree? To produce fruit. And he said to the vineyard vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use the ground? And I got to tell you guys from a personal place, this is extremely potent for me because what you know what I did this week I looked at my vineyard I took videos from my harvest I have 60 vines and so every one of them needs to produce because real estate is expensive I looked at every one of my vines and I said nope it's been there three years I've trained it I've put fertilizer on it I've done everything and it's still not producing fruit and guess what I'm doing in two months I'm ripping them out So, what happens? The man replies and says to him, No, no, wait, wait. Let it alone, sir. For this year, too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. Here's what you need to get. Each of us in Jesus' parable, is the fig tree. The reason we don't see karma, the reason it seems like it doesn't matter what you do, is because God is incredibly patient with you. The judgment is coming. The judgment will fall. God will not be mocked. But the God of second chances continues to give even the most evil of us Opportunity after opportunity to repent, but not forever. 
God pours out his son. He pours out his rain again and again and again, but not forever. We need to know what time it is. So what was Jesus' whole point in everything we read in Luke 13 this morning? I tell you, unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Those people were no worse than you, and you, you need to repent. Aren't you happy you came to church for this uplifting message this morning? Your job, and this is, this is, this is the Lord speaking to me right now, speaking to me. Langdon, your job is not to understand how everything goes together. Or why some people experience terrible accidents while other people seem incredibly lucky. Your job is to be responsible for your own life and to repent. To turn from your own ways to the ways of God. To notice when you're drifting into the ways of the world. Drifting into selfishness and greed and hypocrisy and gossip and judgmentalism and self-righteousness and repent. Now some of us in this room... And I would tend to be more in this category. We need to repent of our smugness and our self-righteousness. But some of you need to repent of your self-hatred. Some of you are self-loathing. You have self-hatred. I got news for you. You don't get a medal for that. That's as bad a sin as being smug and self-righteous. It's despising the beautiful gift that you are. God gave that gift. So I think all of us here, this is for all of us. So here's the thing. Repentance is not just a one-time thing. Sure, when you're, you know, you're deciding, am I really going to be a Christian? Am I going to ask Jesus into my heart? Yes, there comes this major moment of repentance. But it's not like, okay, now I'm good with that. No, repentance, what is that? It is a lifestyle of stepping into the light of God's truth again and again and again. And every time, every time, I mean, the shadows, and then I, sorry, camera crew, I step out into the light, I notice all the lint, right? I notice all the stuff that's wrong, and I need to repent. The Christian life is stepping again and again into the light of God's word. Notice that the scripture we just looked at in Matthew is actually part of a very famous saying of Jesus that we've quoted here over and over again because it's so key and it's especially key in a political polarized nation like ours he says you've heard it said love your neighbors love your clan and hate your enemies but I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The people get caught up on that perfect The Greek word there, it comes from telos. It's the idea of completed at the end. In other words, spiritually mature. Therefore, you are to be spiritually mature just as your heavenly father is. Out of his love and mercy, God sends the blessing of sun and the blessing of rain on both the just and the unjust. In other words, he treats his enemies as well as he treats his loved ones. That is how good and gracious and generous he is. And that is how we are to act too. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He's given us the example to follow. He doesn't treat us according to our sins, according to what we deserve. And in our personal relationships with other people, we're to act the same way. In other words, you are to treat people better than they deserve. Well, that's not fair. Sure isn't. You are to treat other people better than they deserve. Now, I don't know about you, but this does not come naturally to me at all. You know, we were just talking yesterday about being scrupulous. Like, Ruth and I, for good or evil, some of you know, we both have this very strong sense of right and wrong. And because of that, 
When somebody gets away with something, it kind of bugs us. No, you are to treat them better than they deserve. Listen to what Jesus says to you in John and then in Matthew. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you, Christian, who loves Jesus, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. But how do we live this way? How how can I become like that? It's so unnatural for me. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The closer I hug to Jesus and yield to him, the more I become the person that God is calling me to be. There's a lot of mystery and unanswered questions in this life. And Jesus says, yep, that's right. There's a lot that from the human perspective just seems like random fate. And Jesus says, yep, that's right. So there's a lot of things you will not get clear answers to this side of heaven. And Jesus refuses to give us simple explanations or make promises that don't come true. But what do we see in a lot of American churches today? I think there's a lot that passes for Christianity these days that is more like pagan religion. Full of magical thinking and false promises. It's more filled with that than the inconvenient truths that Jesus actually taught us. Because I have a question. When you make claims and promises in the name of God and they don't come true, what does that make you? A false prophet. Some people promise you, if you only have enough faith, all these great things are going to happen to you and you're going to be shielded from the way the world works. That is exactly the third temptation that Jesus faced last week. And what did he say? No, that is not true. But here is what is true. If you walk with me, you will become the person you were always meant to be. You will live a life of meaning and purpose. And I will bring you safely home after your sojourn here on earth is done. I am not promising you that you will not have terrible chapters in the middle. I'm promising you that the story ends well. So don't trust in magical thinking. Don't trust in superstition. Don't trust in snake oil salesmen. Don't trust in signs or omens. Trust in me. All other ground is sinking sand. The Christian life doesn't solve all the mysteries. It opens you up to the world of mysteries. You know, before I became a Christian, I didn't really wrestle with a lot of those deeper questions. My life was kind of like on autopilot. I was just living on the surface, just doing what everybody else was doing. It's when I became a Christian that the cover was ripped off my universe. All of a sudden, I started thinking, well, wait, wait, if that's true, then what about that? And wait... What does that imply about that? And wait, I started asking many, many more questions after I became a Christian. And this is what's so funny. Some folks who've never walked with Jesus, they say that people turn to religion because they can't handle the ambiguities of life. Other folks say, oh no, once you become a Christian, everything becomes clear. I think they're both wrong. You see, there was a guy who actually met Jesus, who was physically touched by Jesus, who was miraculously healed by Jesus. And yet after all that, think about how much he got. He was still completely uncertain about many, many things. People asked him, why did this happen? They asked him, how did it happen? They asked him, what does it mean? And you know what he said? I don't know. But one thing I do know, one thing, I was blind and now I see. The Christian life is not a life of all certainties. It's having a very, very few rock-solid certainties in the midst of a sea of uncertainties. Okay, Langdon, certainties. Like what? Like Romans 10, 9. 
If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. And in the midst of the confusion and conflicting voices of this world, Micah 3, 6 says, He has showed you, O man, he has showed you, O woman, what is good and what does the Lord require of you in the midst of a world like this full of uncertainties and answers that never come to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Okay, so that's the real big, thank you Langdon for the big philosophical speech, but how about our everyday lives? How do we apply this to our everyday lives? First, we just saw the first step, repent. I need to have this constant act of returning to God on a daily basis. I need to be constantly rehitching my wagon to Jesus. You know, as Jesus went by, people reached out to touch him. As you sense Jesus walking by, you need to hitch your wagon to him. Like a lot of times I'm hitched to him and then I kind of disconnect. I need to return again and again. But second, as far as everyday life and getting on with your life and getting things done in the world, listen to what Ecclesiastes says. Now, I love this scripture. This is our last one for the day. I love this. And originally when I was reading it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. It's all coming together. Everything we've been talking about. It's like Jesus is channeling Ecclesiastes. And then I realized, no, no, it's the exact opposite. Ecclesiastes is channeling the eternal son of God. For all of this word is from the son. Listen to what Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verses 5 to 6 says. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman. There's all kinds of things in this world that I I, I don't know. So you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. So think about this. It's saying there really is a God, a maker of heaven and earth. He's got a plan. He's working it. And by the way, you don't understand it and you don't know. Well, then what do I do in a world like this? Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening. For you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed. You do not know. Or whether both of them alike will be good. So sometimes it's going to seem like you have a lot of good luck. And sometimes it's going to seem like you have really bad luck. And sometimes things will seem to go really easy. And sometimes things will be really difficult and it will feel like everything's wrong and everything's falling apart. Do the right thing anyway. You don't know how things are going to go. So do the right thing anyway. And if you try once and nothing happens, do it again. So you might go out, well, I sowed in the morning and nothing happened. Then sow in the evening. Do it again. Don't give up. You don't always reap what you sow. But if you keep on reaping, eventually you're going to sow what God would have you sow. This is the way life is in a fallen, broken world. Anyone who claims they know how life works or what the future is going to be has not yet lived enough years under the sun. Don't give up. Don't refuse to sow when you see no results. You get depressed and beaten down and bitter and what's the use? No, you sow again. You don't know which time it's going to take. Sow again. Do what is right. Make the effort for your heavenly father is watching and he values everything that you do. I lied to you. I've got one more scripture. I'm not stopping because listen to this. I want you to hear this. If anybody understood Jesus, if anybody understood theology, if anybody could explain all these crazy things that go on in our life, it's got to be Paul. And listen to what Paul says in chapter 3 of Philippians, starting in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. To take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal 
to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Put your hand to the plow and don't look back. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, you love each person here and you know them by name. You don't promise to explain things to us that are too great for us to understand. There are things that we so badly want to understand and you put your loving arm on us and you say, it is not for you to know. But come, come, follow me. I will give you life to the full. I will complete the good work I began in you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that we can trust you and trust your word. You are the rock that never moves. We give you all glory. We pray in your name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.